Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to the first Q&A webinar of Code for Earth 2024. I'm here with some colleagues uh, from uh, Trust IT and uh, my colleagues also from ACMWF. And, um, you know, without a lot of delay, uh, let's start. Um, we are here today to explain you what is Code for Earth, how you can participate and why you should participate. And uh, at the end of the session, you have also the opportunity to ask some question. Um, my name is Atina Trakas and um, my colleague Esperanza Cuatero, um, uh, she's based in Reading. She will also present. Good. Um, so before I start, we have some questions for you. And uh, I hand, so we, we are using Mentimeter to ask just two questions to get an idea who you are and uh, where you come from, a little bit of your background. So my colleague, Claudio from Trust IT. Um, Hello everyone. So uh, I will uh, please log into those website or scan your QR code. If you uh, if you can, so that then we can have you on on Mentimeter and uh, talk to you. I will also leave in the chat the the link. All right, for everybody. So please. Make sure to join join us at Mentimeter. I will I will give you a couple of minutes time to to log in, and then I'll show my screen with the as the results start coming in. Right. Okay. So I see some results already. So let me share my screen without further ado. So I will unshare Athena for a second, and then we will be up to it. Okay, we go presentation mode here. Right, so the first question is, how did you hear about Code for Earth? We already have 15 people responding, 17. There is a lot of people using Twitter, a lot of people, my colleagues, professor, SNWF, pre previous challenge, searching AI in weather. So we see people from university. So essentially it's both a conjunction of social media activities and university. Somebody has met nice. previous challenges. Then uh, scrolling, there is uh, friends of friends, LinkedIn, GitHub, newsletter. Friends, so there is both word to mouth, I think here, and a lot of uh, social media activities and through universities. So there is a mix. Yeah, this is very specific newsletter of the Institute for Meteorology and Geophysics at the University of Cologne. Excellent. I think we have a whole uh, variety of different sources. Uh, yeah, exactly. Great. So it means that uh, we're doing a good job with social media, but <laughs> also that people are also getting word to mouth from friends and professors at university. Okay, next question, just quickly. What is your country of residence? Let's see if we have some answers about this. The Netherlands, Germany, look speaker, Italy, UK, UK and Germany. Egypt. You omit the Greece. Greece is it's in dark, therefore you cannot see it. Yeah, right exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Greece. Greece is a bit. Yeah, but it's quite big nonetheless. There is also yeah. Japan. So there is yeah. also people not from Europe following us. Spain, Poland. Right, okay. So it seems the core. Uh, of our mem of our speakers, of our uh, audience today are essentially Germany and UK. 
as far as I can see, there is some Italy, some Netherlands, Spain, Japan. Greece is big as well. Yeah. Right. Okay. This was the first break the ice exercise. Okay, we're getting more responses. I think Greece got bigger, although you cannot see it very well, but I think it's yeah. kind of big by now. Right. Okay. So, yeah, thanks everyone. So I grabbed the screen again. And um, so everyone should be able to see my screen now. And yeah, thanks uh, everyone for, for letting us know where how you heard about Code for Earth and where you're from. And yeah, in a few words, what is Code for Earth? Um, yeah, it's a key innovation action run by uh, the European Center of Medium Range Weather Forecasts. And in previous years, we have been supported by Copernicus and Destination Earth as this year as well. Um, but this year, we have also support from the European Environment Agency, Helmholtz Centrum Helion uh, in Gestach, close to Hamburg, uh, and IFAP uh, or IFAP uh, in Bologna. And what we want to do is to make the activities um, of our partners and the center more visible and make everyone aware about what we are doing. You know, using the data for our data, for example, Copernicus data. That is just one idea. Um, other than that, we are engaging external talents with mentors and experts. Um, it's all about collaboration, innovation, and making an impact um, in earth sciences, computer sciences, and um, you know, all around open source software development. Um, as we are in the call for participation right now, we are expecting or we are hoping to see some um, proposals to uh, uh, challenges. And once we have undergone the evaluation phase and selected teams, um, the program grants those selected teams that successfully complete the project a 5,000 euro stipend. Um, who can submit a proposal or who can participate in the program. And the program is essentially open to individuals or, or teams of developers or, you know, groups of people from diverse backgrounds, including earth sciences, computer sciences and software development. And, um, you know, participants can be students at all levels, um, but also professionals, young professionals, uh, that has an interest in um, getting in touch with ECMWF or with some of, of the uh, partner organizations I mentioned up front, um, and people who want to share the future of earth sciences. Um, yeah, uh, an, important, um, an important aspect is uh, the eligibility. And, uh, you know, I know or we know that there will be, there are usually questions. So this year, um, interested participants, nationals or residents from the countries we are referring to uh, below are eligible to submit proposals to all challenges of the 2024 edition. So the countries referred to are um, ECMWF member states and cooperating states. So funding from ECMWF is available for nationals and residents from our from ECMWF member states and cooperating states. And EU funding um, undergoes different or you know, um, some restrictions. So EU funding is available only for nationals from the European Union member states, countries associated with the EU space program and countries associated with the EU's digital Europe program. And uh, you can also read these details and the terms and conditions. Um, and yeah, but the important thing is that everyone who is a participant, uh, sorry, a, a national or a resident of the countries mentioned below can apply or uh, um, submit a proposal to all the challenges. Um, and, but before we look into the details now of Code for Earth, um, and how Code for Earth works, um, I would like to briefly mention our challenges partner. I mentioned that this year we expanded, we have grown, 
And uh, I want to especially highlight some joint challenges we have with our partner organization, we call them the Code for Earth partners. So that's one uh, I want to mention here. We have a challenge with CSOC and the, or the University of Bonn. Then the European Environment Agency, we have two challenges that have been to de developed together with the European Environment Agency and ECMWF. Then one with the Helmholtz Centrum Herion and a challenge, another challenge has been uh, jointly um, developed with the University of Reading and ECMWF. And they are labeled uh, in GitHub, as you know, all challenges are available um, and described on GitHub. So you can also find the joint challenges with our partner network. So how does Cope for Earth um, work? Athena, I think there is a question if you want to answer yes. them now. Yes. Somebody's asking, uh, what if my country of residence is not listed, for example, Japan? Or another one asks, which challenge are also open to non-EU citizens, if any? Yeah, so that is, um, so if if you're uh, Japanese and you live in Japan, uh, then unfortunately um, we cannot, you cannot participate in Code for Earth this year. So um, as we have funding from different sources, including the EU, like, you know, um, Copernicus or uh, Destination Earth, we need to ensure, you know, to be compliant with the regulations and applicable rules uh, that come from the European Commission. So, but if you are a national, um, uh, from a country that is not listed there, but a resident of one of the countries listed here, you can participate in the challenges. Um, challenges that are not uh, upfront assigned one-on-one -on -one, uh, to one of these fundings. So we are working, um, you know, we will define later um, which challenge uh, comes under which rule. For now, if you want to apply or submit a proposal, um, you have to be a national or a resident of the countries mentioned here. Um, if it's, this is not the case, then unfortunately, um, you know, it's difficult for us to, to provide or guarantee you um, the prize or the, if, if you're selected, you know, you are not, uh, unfortunately not eligible to participate in Code for Earth this year. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, I'm sorry that, uh, but we have also to fulfill some rules and uh, we try to make it as open as possible. Um, but this is a set of rules we have to come up with. Good. Um, now, how, you know, how does Code for Earth, how does the program uh, look? So we have defined four steps from the call for participation to the final Code for Earth Day. And um, the, we are currently in, in, in step one. This is the call for participation. You're, so please check out GitHub where you can find the entire list of challenges. Um, then we have the uh, Q&A webinars, that's today and next week. And we encourage everyone to ask questions on GitHub. And just uh, you know, to give you an idea, here's the 2024 um, Code for Earth challenges. You have, a, uh, again, some information. And then we have sorted the we have sorted the all the challenges with the nineteen challenges in different streams, and we encourage you um, to click on a challenge of interest for you. And if you have questions, you can ask them um, here on GitHub. Uh, so after um, the call for participation is over. Um, 9th of April, so please submit your proposal until uh, 9th of April. We will go, then the work is on our side, and we will go through an evaluation phase with the mentors, so they will um, evaluate the submit submitted proposals, and uh, end of April, we will announce the select proposals. Uh, those teams or individuals that have been selected, they will join um, with their members, the coding phase, and uh, in four months over over the summer, 
until the uh, end of August. The teams will work with the mentors on the projects. It's about collaboration um, and also between uh, during this coding phase, there will be two midterm webinars where we are presenting the teams and the projects. And then step four, that's the final day where we will celebrate um, the completion of the program. We will showcase and document um, the results of Code for Earth 2024. Um, and now, as we go into a little bit more detail, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Esperanza, <clears throat> who will explain how you can develop a nice uh, proposal and provide some recommendations and tips. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Just, just right before that, yes. we have a bunch of questions that are in the chat if you want to um, answer them right now, or if you want to wait until the end of the webinar, we can also do that. <clears throat> And but there are, there are a bunch of questions that uh, are actually um, good uh, questions. Um, so I would prefer to to leave the questions at the end of the webinar because maybe some response you are finding during our presentation. So it is not not to break the workflow. Yeah. So thank you very much, Satina. Yes. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah hello, everyone. Um, as as Adina say, says, this uh, Code for 2024, this edition has released 19 challenges. All these uh, open source uh, challenges are published on GitHub. So uh, this year, these 19 challenges have been uh, classified in three streams. The first stream is data visualization for earth science applications. The second stream is machine learning for earth science uh, applications. And the third stream is software development. As I said, all these challenges are GitHub. So we encourage you to go there to this open source platform and read carefully the description of the challenge, check the skills you need to tackle this challenge and, and with all the information you can choose, uh, the challenge suits you the most. Uh, in terms of uh, experience, uh, background, or, or your preference. Uh, one of the great possibilities uh, GitHub gives us is that you can um, engage, uh, start a conversation with the mentors. The mentors are the minds behind the challenge. So they come up with the original idea. So they are the best contact, the best source of information for you to ask. So if there's something which is not 100% clear to you, please engage with your mentors and ask the questions using GitHub. So they, they are not going to write the submission for you and they are not going to, to um, review your proposal before the submission. That, that's not gonna happen, but they can, uh, their feedback is very useful to you to Taylor, your your final uh, proposal. So as I said, I encourage you to go to GitHub and, and start a conversation with them, with the mentors. And don't forget to submit your proposals uh, by 9 of April. This is the deadline. Thank you. Next slide. Yes. We would like to give you some tips and recommendations. Uh, they are very useful. And, and please take note. Mm, your submission is a technical solution to, to one challenge. So uh, please bear in mind this, this technical solution needs to be feasible in four months. These four months is the duration of the coding phase from May to the end of August. So please don't write a proposal which required a year to be developed because it's not gonna work. You need to be precise, clear, uh, you, you write a very well-structured proposal and, and submit it by 9th of April. And don't add unnecessary complexity to the proposal. What does it mean? It means that um, don't be very ambitious and write 50 pages of proposal, um, but either don't write a very short paragraph. So be sensible. And, and straight to the point. It has to be, uh, there's, there's a tip and it's a must. You need to plan ahead and, and draw a kind of timeline with uh, milestones 
and deliverables because it going is going to help you uh, during the coding phase uh to a structure or to help you organize your tax during your tax during the coding phase so uh so please don't forget uh, create a timeline with milestones and deliverables at the end of the coding phase you need to present a, a, an outcome it's compulsory you need to to um, to present a project and a result so this this kind of a, a strategy uh timeline it helps you and pay off at the end yeah uh next slide please yes example is structure so what do you need to include in your proposal uh, first a brief description of the problem uh your your solution your technical solution that, that one you propose and for that, when elaborating the proposal, please uh, include the software tools you're going to use, also the data you're going to use, and, and services. As I said, I repeat myself, please include a timeline with milestones and the deliver deliverables. And uh, the last bullet, if it's optional, but it could be very well rated, if you include a plan, a plan, um, where you foreseen uh, the outcome of your project uh, in, in the future. Next slide, yes. So when the deadline, all of you have submitted your proposals uh, and at what happened after 9 of April. So um, in during about two weeks, uh, there will be an internal panel and will they will evaluate all the proposals they have received. Uh, they are going to rate these proposals uh, following different criteria or different categories, such as comprehensibility, clarity and structure, feasibility, easy to maintain, uh, innovation and transferability. Uh, I encourage you to go to the FAQ in, uh, in our website. In the FNQ, there is a section uh, dedicated to these uh, criteria of this evaluation process. So, uh, before submitting your proposal, check all the boxes are are compiled, and and it, it helps you to tailor your proposal. And when when it will be announced, the selected teams. So this is the 29th of April. So for all updates, uh, follow us in our social media platforms and also be announced on our website but of course we will uh, email privately to all of, of the teams that which are selected and, and the ones who are not selected so when the teams are formed and it starts the coding phase is the step number three of the of our program this is the most exciting uh, exciting phase of the program because it's when the collaboration happens. Uh, fresh ideas, innovative ideas, expertise and, and experience collaborate, team up, I mean mentors and participants, and they start to shape the, what, the, what was an, a challenge. They are starting to develop and transform in a project. As I say, the coding phase uh, lasts four months from mm, the 2nd of May to mm, the, the last day of August. And during this phase, we also have uh, organized, we organ organize, uh, prepare uh, mid-time webinars. During this, these webinars, uh, the, the selected teams can, um, can give us a, a, a touch, you know, a flavor of the way we are doing, you know, we are developing. So we, we call it the midterms and the percent the first result. Uh, and you can follow all the progress of the of these projects during the coding phase on GitHub. Yes, it's open source, it's, it's public. Yes, and after the step three, uh, once the deliverables, your deliverables have been accepted by mentors, this is key. Uh, everything is, is okay. Uh, you receive a green light from your mentors we go we go ahead we to a step forward with it's the final code for us this is an event a hybrid event which uh, will take part in will be hosted in ismwf headquarters in in reading uk 
on the 18th of September. We invite all the teams, all the selected teams, to present their, their projects, their, their, their final results. So it is a celebratory uh, day, and we celebrate success and, and also the end of the, of the program. I think it's all for me. I hand over Tina. Yeah, thank you, Esperanza. OK, um, you know, this is very short term time that's not time to go too much into detail but we hope you know uh the tips and recommendations from esperanza um give you already a direction um and you know why should you submit a proposal um and i think there are many many reason reasons uh first of all you know you can join the code for earth community and uh, code for earth has been around since 2018 and we have uh, supported nearly 50 projects. So the community is growing. Uh, another option or opportunity is if you select a pro or if you submit a proposal and you're selected, you can learn from mentors. And I would say already um, the phase now where you can go on GitHub, ask questions on GitHub, give you an, an idea, gives you an idea. What are the real world scenarios, the real world questions, all the colleagues um, in the center, but also in the partner organizations are working on or the research questions. So, you know, it's a, I think you can broaden your network. Um, then of course, if you're keen in developing um, open source is the way to go, in my opinion. And so you can work on open source projects. And last but not least, uh, <clears throat> if you're selected, and as Speranza pointed out, is if you have successfully finished your project, you can uh, get an award of 5,000 euros. <clears throat> um, but, you know, I would like to hand over now to Mario Santa Cruz, who is with us on, on, on the panel, because he's a participant of Code for Earth uh, from last year, and he was involved in one uh, in the project called Deep R, um, Deep Reanalysis. Um, so, Mario, maybe you can explain a little bit, you know, um, the process. How did you join, or you know, what did you do? Um, how the application phase was, uh, the the call for participation. What did you do, and how your experience with the program was? <clears throat> Hi, Athena. Thank you Hi. very much for the presentation. Um, I will go briefly over um, my experience in last year challenge, and then anything you want to ask, uh, feel free to to drop a comment in the in the chat, and I will be happy to to answer those. So I participated in the 2021 edition, and also in 2023 edition. That is the challenge that I'm uh, presenting now to you. In this challenge, uh, the idea was to use uh, machine learning models to uh, increase the resolution of the reanalysis data sets. In this case, we, we moved from ERA5 to CIRA that are offering the climate data store. Um, the problem was, was clear, was to, to increase this resolution and uh, try different techniques like uh, generative adversarial networks or diffusion models. So the idea here is to, to research about the implementation of these methods uh, to try how they work. Um, the challenge won't be uh, success successful if you don't uh, beat uh, the, the, the best models. Um, so the thing here is important to to set uh, realistic objectives uh, that you can achieve whether or not the models um, are are good or better than we have now. Um, I I participated in this in this challenge with my team of a colleague from my previous uh, job, uh, Antonio, and, and a researcher from from IFCA that is like. Um, uh, a department uh, from the university um, and personally my background was um, working a lot of in the modeling uh, I had a lot of experience in modeling problems 
in particular computer vision or time series. And here is one of the things that you have to take account in the in your proposal. You will have to to write clearly those uh, advantages that make you um, the best option for solving that challenge. So for me, it was the case that uh, I have a lot of experience with computer vision that is very similar to the problem mentioned because we were trying to increase the resolution of two images. Those images correspond to physical variables, but at the end they are just images. So um, just uh, it is important to, to know your, uh, your strengths and your team's strength, not only yours. And then for the proposal, what we try to do is focus on three things um, in the proposal, three things that we consider that uh, you have to, to state clearly. That is uh, what, what are you, what are you doing? Do you understand really the challenge? You have to demonstrate this in the proposal. Also, you can do a literature re review of the thing, of the things that um, people is doing in, a, in this in this research area, and also explain the motivation for solving this this problem. Also, how you are gonna do it? Uh, set a timeline with milestones. Um, explain the methodology, the technology that you are using. Uh, below, I I, I I included the initial timeline that we presented, and the, our our current timeline uh, was very different, but just uh, shows some initial pl initial planning of what you are planning to do. And then why you, this is what I was explaining before, what's your background, your technical expertise, uh, the experience that you have that matches with the with the challenge and also your ambition to, to solve this. So I think that at the end, if you are watching this webinar, um, I just um, recommend you to, to submit a proposal. Um, I think that you don't regret. And one of the most important things that that you will be achieving with this is the the people you meet, the um, just not from from mentors, but also colleagues from another another challenge. Um, for sure, the the mentors will will help you a lot, and you will I'm sure you will will learn a lot of from from them. So this is for for me, Atina. Uh, thank you, Mario. Um, yeah, maybe maybe there because there, there is a question in in the in the general chat. Um, it was about the time. Um, I, I, I didn't find it. So, how much time roughly did you did you um, spend uh, on a weekly basis? Uh, do, do you have that in mind? I, I think <clears throat> it, it depends on how you organize with the, with your mentors. This is something that you will talk to them. For example, as uh, we we met almost uh, weekly or bi-weekly to to check the the progress, and also for for us was interesting to to get this relationship with the mentors to know what they think. So I think that the idea is to to maintain a a, a pace, uh, an easy pace, probably something like I, I don't know. It depends also in the the number of people on the project, uh, what, your ambition. But probably we were dedica dedicating like ten hours a week, each of us, so just like a rough estimate. Yeah, but it could be something like that. Yeah, uh, thanks. And uh, so Esperanza and I, we sent out a survey after, uh, you know, um, when Code for Earth finished. And we had from from the from the participating teams, we had roughly about this number, 12 hours weekly. Um, this is a, more or less the time, 12 to 15 hours they spend on, on the challenge. But of course, as, as Mario said, it also depends how you're organized, um, also how you know how complicated the challenge might be. Maybe you come across some challenges in your challenge. So um, 
but that is more or less roughly the time um, that is required or that has been um, told we have been told that this is roughly the time the teams have been uh, have been spending on code for earth good okay um so if there are any dedicated questions also to mario please use the q a part and <clears throat> sorry so we are here now for the q a's um and so the easiest is if you answer if you ask questions on the q a part but let me quickly go through um the general chat um <clears throat> so i answered the question uh with japan uh, which challenges are also open to non-EU citizens, citizens, if any. And I think the important aspect is here, if you are, uh, you know, it's um, EU member states plus uh, Digital Europe uh, plus EU space program and uh, the ECMWF mem um, member and cooperating states. And either you are a citizen or a resident, um, just as I stated, or as we stated in the presentation earlier. Um, yeah, the question on the company side has been answered. Mm -hmm. um, um, Bie asks, I don't have a team, but I would happily team up with other individuals. If someone would like to team up, please let me know. That's excellent. Um, <clears throat> so please uh, reach out to Bie. The other aspect here is if anyone is interested in a challenge, you know, you can uh, get in touch with the mentors and you can ask questions there. And maybe you can also do the networking part with other potential uh, or interested people on this challenge. Um, and, and you can the net, do the networking also through GitHub. <clears throat> and um, yeah, there's the link to GitHub. Is there a maximum number of team members? No. So, yeah. <laughs> You're right with it, yes. Uh, yeah, so Esperanza we and I, we talked about that. And of course, if you're a very big group, yeah. you know, you ha you still have to do the work. If the group is too big, maybe it's, uh, it gets challenging, um, but we don't have any any limits. Uh, one thing, uh, be aware that, the, you know, the, the Esteban, the 5,000 uh, euros is, is per, per project. No, no per number of teams members. Yes, very good point. Um, <clears throat> so the Indian Kenya player. Could you repeat with criteria the proposal will be judged against? Yes, I I also write all the all the criteria mm -hmm. and refer to the FAQ. Exactly. <clears throat> good. Uh... I don't know, Monica, which is uh, Monica's uh, question. Um, so we'll quickly move over to the... There's a few more questions. Yeah. <clears throat> um, somebody's asking, uh, do we need to write about our background and expertise in the proposal, as Mario mentioned, about a section about why you? I think this is a question to, to you, Mario, as well. I think that you don't have to, but um, I was uh, telling you how we prepare our proposal and one thing that we consider important um, to include in the proposal, just why 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 we fit this this challenge. Um, thank you, Mario. Another question is, how many teams will be selected this year? Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> uh, Robert, many thanks for the question. So, we are, it, it depends, you know, we can probably um, select up to 19 proposals, uh, but it always depends on, on the quality of the proposals, yeah um you know so the the mentors decide um if they have good proposals for their challenges um and then we'll see 
Um, and someone is asking something in the Q&A. Um, as an international student residing in one of the cooperating states, am I eligible according to your definition of a resident? Yes. Okay, sorry, sorry, Sanjay, T and C, so it's true, it's uh, terms and conditions, <laughs> my, my wrong. Good. Um, Sarah, are there any other questions? No, not for the moment. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah. There's another one. Do you select multiple proposals from different teams for a single challenge? Um, we can do that. Uh, so that happened, that was the case last year with one challenge. Um, it depends really on the quality of the proposals. Um, uh, the eligibility rules, as Peranza mentioned, um, and the evaluation phase, there will be a threshold. You know, if you are rated below this uh, threshold, the proposal is, um, you know, cannot be selected. If you're over the threshold, it depends on the mentors to decide uh, either, either if they want to select one or two teams. I don't think that for one challenge, we will go over three teams, but you know, this is really on the mentors um, and as mentioned on the quality of the submitted proposal proposals. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so is the Q and A that are there? No, is there any specific question? Yeah, <clears throat> so there's a good. Do all the team members have to be from the EU? Um, the important thing is, uh, and I, I want to mention it again, it's about uh, residents or citizens from EU member states and ECMW of member and cooperating states. And we have the list of countries uh, in on, on the website in the terms of end and conditions. So, and yes, you have to be a resident or a citizen, a national of the, these countries. Good. Yeah, that was, we have uh, one more minute. So at this point, uh, thanks a lot for everyone uh, joining on the panel also. Uh, Mario, thanks uh, for your time uh, to talk about uh, Cook for Earth. Um, a special thanks again to our partners this year uh, and supporters, uh, especially, you know, CSOC and the University of Bonn, uh, the European Environment Agency, uh, Helmholtz Centrum Herion, uh, then University of Ready, Reading, and uh, IFAB, IFAB uh, in Bologna. So that's great to see that we are growing also from that perspective. We highly encourage um, we highly encourage you to ask your questions about the challenges on GitHub. And with that, there's one last question: uh, Does the other webinar cover the same things as this one? Yes, it does. So yeah, and we invite you to subscribe again to the to the uh, to the next webinar. If you have any more questions that you would like to ask to uh, our team at uh, Code for Hearth, so I will drop the link in the chat for you to subscribe and uh, make sure to do that if you have some still some unanswered questions. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, also, Sarah and uh, Claudio. Yes, three team here. And we wish you a nice afternoon. Thank you. And don't forget the deadline, 9 of April. <laughs> and I encourage you, I encourage you, you engage with your mentors of the challenge. So they are, they are pleased to respond to your questions. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.